new year, new car, new drivers, new setting to host the exhibition race known as The Clash. But for the first time ever since 1971, 50 years ago, we will start a NASCAR race inside of a football stadium and what better place than one of the most famous stadiums in the world, the Los Angeles Coliseum in California is a site for the inaugural Bush-like clash at the Coliseum in Los Angeles. Welcome everyone to an episode of MDK Race Day. My name is Jed. Hope you're all having a wonderful Sunday morning. Before we get into it, if you haven't already, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe for more content. And tell me in the comment section down below, who do you think is going to win this race? We got some stuff to talk about, so let's not waste any time and jump right into it. Over 70,000 fans are expected to attend this race. We have a ton of new people, new celebrities coming to the sport. We have Ice Cube performing at halftime, Pitbull is having a pre-race concert, whole bunch of celebrities, Grand Marshals, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar is going to be on it. I mean, it is going to be one huge event and I am so excited. I've never been this excited for a race probably in the entire time I've been watching NASCAR. I've been watching NASCAR for 10 years and the only time I can really, I really see myself being this excited for a race was probably Homestead 2016 because as you can tell, I was a Jimmy Johnson fan. Other than that, this is the most excited I've ever been for a NASCAR Cup race. Now, there was one practice session and single car qualifying run on Saturday. And one thing I was quite surprised by how smooth everything was because none of us expected how this race will go or how, you know, racing at a football stadium would go with these new next gen cars. And it surprisingly went well. Now, yes, it was a much smaller field. I think around 10 to 12 cars were out on track for uh, for practice each session because remember, it's being broken up into groups now. But still, we saw some bumping between Corey Joy and Kevin Harvick, saw some, you know, drivers make some nice passes on the inside lane. We saw a lot of drivers really get in that sticky stuff, the paint uh, on the inside, the very inside of the racetrack where the rumble strips are. We saw a lot of drivers getting very close to that or close to the inside wall to try and make a pass to try and hook an arch that corner coming off the, the corner, get a good drive off. Um, and there's still a huge unknown, but at least we get an idea of who are the favorites for the Bush Clash. So after single car qualifying, the top four was Kyle Bush, Tyler Reddick, Justin Haley, and Joe Logano. Those four drivers will start on will start on pole in their respective heat races. Now let's take a look at what the race format for the Bush Clash. Four races, 25 laps each. The top four, you have to be in the top four if you want to advance automatically to the main 150 lap event. If you're not in the top four races in your respective heat race, then you will be sent to the last chance qualifier. Now there are two LCQs, 50 laps apiece. The top three from each of those last chance qualifiers will move on to the main event. So the top four in the four heat races, the top three in the two last chance qualifiers, and a provisional to the highest points position guy from last year's uh, last year's season which right now will automatically be Kyle Larson he's the only driver that is safe uh, from being uh, going home from going home in the clash now let's take a look at the starting lineup for the four heat races now since Kyle Bush he was fastest from everyone in Saturday night's qualifying race he will start in pole position in heat race number one next to him is Daniel Suarez Ricky Sales Jr. and Ryan Blaney row two row three Denny Hamlin and Eric Amarola BJ McLeod and rookie Todd Gillen and Ross Chastain rounds out heat race number one. Number two will go to Tyler Reddick and Cole Custer, Harrison Byrne and Alex Bowman, Bubba Wallace, Austin Dillon, Chase Briscoe, Brad Keselowski, and Martin Truex Jr. Heat three has Coley Racing's Justin Haley and 2020 Cup Series champ Chase Elliott, William Byron and Christopher Bell, Almendinger and Kevin Harvick, Chris Buescher and Corey LaJoy and Cody Ware. And finally, heat race number four, Joe Logano and Kyle Larson, the defending champion, Michael McDowell and Landon Castle, Austin Sindrick and Eric Jones, Ryan Priest and Kirk Bush with Ty Dillon rounding out the field. Now let's take a look at the odds to win the Bushlight Clash at the Coliseum by BetMGM. Denny Hamlin and Kyle Larson, they're at the top of the board, plus 600 each, as well as Chase Elliott. Martin Trick Jr., plus 700. Not, not surprised to see him up there, considering how good he is at Martinsville. Kyle Bush, plus 800. Then teammates Ryan Blinney, Joe Logano, plus 1,000. Byron, plus 1,200. And then Kevin Harvick, plus 1,600. Bell, 1,800. Keselowski and Bowman, 2000 Kurt Busch 2500 and Austin Sindrick and Tyler Reddick 3300 
I mean, here's some other notables. I mean, you got Eric Amarola and Chastain, 4,000. Amarola and Austin Dillon, 8,000. And then Harrison Burn, Bubba Wallace, and Chase Briscoe, 10,000. Plus 10,000. So, uh, but when you really look at this, uh, the uh, the odds to win, I don't say it's meaningless, but kind of. <laughs> I mean, you don't know. First of all, we don't even know who's going to be in the main event. And even when we do get to the main event, we still probably have no idea what's going to happen because that's why the odds are so difficult to really see who is really the favorite. Again, we did point out some drivers like Reddick, Kyle Busch, Chase Briscoe, I think, and some notable drivers that could stand out like maybe Almending or Justin Haley. Hell, <laughs> maybe even Landon Castle or Cody Ware. But those are just names of possibilities that could stand out. We really can't pick a favorite. But that's one of the reasons why I love this race right now. We don't know who the favorite is. Not even Kyle Larson is a favorite. Yeah, last year we picked Kyle Larson for everything, but you can't do that in this race. You can't pick anyone as a favorite. Not even Kyle Busch, and he's sitting on the pole. You can't pick him as a favorite because you don't know what's going to happen. Now, what's interesting about the one practice session and the one qualifying session was the amount of parity. I mean, in qual or at least in practice, I should say, you saw drivers like Justin Haley, Fourth fastest, uh, Landon Castle, eighth fastest, and that's an Aspire Motorsport car. How about Cody Ware, 13th fastest, LaJoy, 14th, Priest, 15th fastest. I mean, these are drivers and cars you don't expect anywhere near the top 20, and here they are uh, going up against the big dogs. And I think one of those drivers that we need to take a look at is Ryan Priest. I mean, Ryan Priest grew up on modifieds. A quarter mile short track like this is his bread and butter. Even though he's never raced on it, to be fair, no one else has raced on it. Not only that, no one else has raced in the next gen car anywhere. So everyone starts at a clean slate. Ryan Priest, with all that experience and his background being in modifieds, racing in these really, really short, short tracks, I think this could play right into his wheelhouse. So Ryan Priest is the type of guy I would keep an eye on if he makes it, of course, into the 150 lap event. Also, Chase Briscoe, I feel like, is, would be another driver that uh, this type of racetrack, this quarter mile racetrack, plays right into his wheelhouse. Third fastest in practice. But there's also the possibility of some big name drivers that could not, could possibly lose their shot and make it into the main event. I mean, look at Brad Keselowski and Kirk Busch. They're ones that are starting near the back in their respective heat races, as well as Martin Trix Jr. I mean, these are champions of the series that are starting near the back. If they cannot work the way up towards the front, who knows? It's, it, it can get very, very rough when we get into the last chance qualifiers, which I think are going to be the very, the most entertaining part of the whole day <laughs> of the whole day will be those last chance qualifiers because you're going to see some big name drivers. I won't be surprised if you see some champions from the series having to fight their way into the race in the last chance qualifiers. And you're, it's going to get extremely aggressive. And we, again, we saw in practice already a lot of beating and banging in practice. Yes, it's a quarter of a mile short track, but still we saw, I was surprised by the amount of, um, bumping and beating we saw against you know different drivers like Corla Joy and Kevin Harvick. I think Harvick got into another driver as well. Uh, I think even Ryan Blaney made some contact with another driver. I mean, there was, there was a good amount of contact, surprising for practice. So I think because of that, the last chance qualifiers are going to really be the most important part of the whole day because you're gonna see drivers doing everything they can in order to make their way into the 150 main event. As for the 150 lapper, Obviously, restarts are going to be chaotic, especially with the track being really cool, tires being very sticky. They're not, they don't have enough grip on the racetrack. You're going to see cars slipping and sliding, a lot of overheating the brakes or uh, lock up into the corners. We saw a lot of that in qualifying and in practice, drivers getting in into the corners and locking up the brakes, locking up the tires and drifting up the racetrack. On a restart with 22 other cars in the mix, could make for some very, very wild moments. And overall, this is going to be huge, not only in terms of the racing, just from the day itself, but also for the future of NASCAR. Depending on the success of this race, could determine the future of NASCAR looking at other urban populations that have stadiums that could be equipped to hold a stock car race. I mean, who knows? Depending on the success of the Bush Clash, Many things could take place. Number one, NASCAR could get a whole bunch of new and young fan base. And when you think about it, I mean, think about this. 70%, according to NASCAR, 70% of the people that are going to the Bush Clash have never been to a race in their entire lives. It's going to be uh, NASCAR could have the possibility of gaining a much more younger audience, especially going out to a place like L.A., which is, no which is nothing like NASCAR's 
core main audience, which is from the South, they can get a whole new batch of fans. NASCAR can really build up their population in the West Coast. Again, like I said, they can potentially re uh, reach out to other stadiums in the future that are in urban populations. I mean, I don't, I don't really know exactly. I can't think of some on the top of my head, but I'm pretty sure there are a lot of stadiums in very popular cities that could, or at least around the same size as the Coliseum, the NASCAR could take a look at if this is if this is a success. Yeah, overall, I am extremely excited for this race, and I know a lot of people are. There's a lot of people that are skeptical about this because it, the, we're, what I'm listening up is all the positives. However, there could be a, ba a downside to this. If this fails, I mean, this is going to be... Ooh, this is going to look really bad on NASCAR. If it's good, if it turns out good... At NASCAR, there's going to be so much praise for the sport and also so much momentum because you're going to have two marquee races. You have the Coliseum, and then two weeks later, you have the Daytona 500. A huge, huge wave of momentum for NASCAR going into the biggest race of their year if this race is a success. If it's not, all that momentum is dead. So NASCAR is riding a lot. They are banking on this to be a success. They have thrown all their eggs into the basket on this race being a success, and if, as, as long as we don't get a wreck fest, I think this will be a success. If it does become a wreck fest, then we're just going to be cringing, wanting this to end, and we hope we never come back here. But if it's a success, then we're going to come back here for multiple years and, like I said, expand to other stadiums and cities around America. But yeah, again, NASCAR is riding a lot on this play. If it goes well, they're going to get the green light to look at other possibilities, especially with this next-gen car apparently being so versatile. It's able to tack on, tackle on a lot of new challenges, like with road course racing uh, and things like that. Who knows? We could see street course racing. We could see, like I said, even more races in stadiums. Who knows? Maybe more dirt races. I don't know. But if this race is a success, NASCAR will get the green light to be able to tackle on as many opportunities as they can, new challenges, new hills to climb over with this next-gen car and with the sport in the not-so-distant future. But yeah, I am overall excited for this race. I cannot wait to see what happens, and I hope it becomes a success because all this does, if this race does become a success, NASCAR's popularity, or at least its momentum, is going to skyrocket into the Daytona 500. That is going to conclude this episode of MVK Race Day. Guys, tell me in the comment section down below. What do you think is going to happen, and who do you think will win the push flash at the Coliseum? Again, tell me in the comment section down below. But until next time, my name is Jet. Thank y'all so much for watching. Enjoy the race, and I'll see you later tonight for an episode of MVK Racing Victory Style, where we recap everything that took place in the Bush Light Flash at the Coliseum. Enjoy the race, everyone. Bye.